that my powers of introducing tonight's speaker. And just want to point out that these weeknight lectures and performances, Authors Corner on Mondays, Healthy Living on Tuesdays, Discover Alaska Lectures on Wednesdays, Music in the Garden on Thursdays, are the result of Michelle Bartlett's vision and hard work building on UAS historic outreach to the, to the community. Uh, obviously, the incredibly effective connector Michelle is, an advocate, and demonstrating the value that the university brings in adding to a community's quality of life with a depth and breadth of lectures and courses and travel programs and school programs offered through summer sessions and lifelong learning. And with that, let me introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Tony Bonatadabas, who recently joined the medical staff of Foundation Health Partners at the Tamil Valley Clinic, board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology, American Board of Pediatrics, memberships in the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and as a fairly recent transplant from Georgia, a member of the Southeastern Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Society, and the Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Society of Georgia. He has appointments as an assistant professor attending position in Allergy and Immunology at the Medical College of Virginia, and previously held an Allergy Immunology Clinical Faculty appointment at the Medical College of Georgia. So with that, I would like to uh, uh, doctor, mention Dr. Bon Thomas will be presenting food allergies, reactions, risks, and resources. And please join me in welcoming them to this evening's Healthy Living Lecture. So uh, the food allergy topic was kind of assigned to me. I was given a title, and then I made a talk to try to fit to it. And I was faced with the dilemma of, of the entirety of food allergy in an hour. So I, I could either be very superficial and broad or excruciatingly detailed on a couple of topics and bore you to death that way. I decided to go with a little bit of both. Um, uh, so I have no disclosures, no stock holdings or anything like that. So all this is, uh, is gonna be based uh, mostly straight out of the literature and uh, the allergy practice parameters are, are mostly my guide. We should have some objectives though. I try to make them uh, straightforward and simple, but hopefully at the end of this, you'll identify the most common food allergens. That's gonna be the focus of most of the talk. You'll be aware of some different mechanisms for how food allergy can happen. Uh, be familiar with some atypical food allergies, a couple of the coolest food allergies I could think of, and then uh, identify the primary treatment for food allergy. And spoiler alert, it's don't eat it. Uh, so these are the topics we'll be hitting. First is just wh why I'm using the material I'm using. A lot of the talks I did were for uh, training pediatricians or allergy fellows in training. And so they always wanted to know why they needed to know that for their boards. So uh, we would base that on some very factual criteria, uh, mainly the practice parameters. We're gonna define food allergy, tell you why it's important. We're gonna go over the most common food allergens, kind of the usual suspects or ringleaders of the group. And then we're gonna focus on peanut in this LEAP study. Is anybody familiar with the LEAP study at all? It's kind of groundbreaking new direction uh, we're going with food allergies. Uh, complete, not 360, 180 degrees from where we were just 10 years ago, 15 years ago on this topic. Uh, and it's, it's just a neat story on how they came up with the idea in the first place. So we'll go into the LEAP study, which is probably the most important food allergy uh, research of the past 20, 30 years. Oral allergy syndrome, I call that a Fairbanks favorite. I've seen that in clinic more in the six months I've been here than the entirety of the time I was in Georgia. There's something about our birch tree pollen counts that drive that condition. So we'll hit the highlights of oral allergy syndrome. Then we'll talk about alpha-gal allergy. That's one of my favorites. That was a big player down in Georgia because of the outdoorsmen and their tick bites. Um, but that's uh, a, a red meat, mammal meat uh, allergy triggered by a tick bite. So again, one of the cool ones we'll go over. Eosinophilic esophagitis is another newer condition diagnosed probably in the years since I did my training. We'll go over that uh, a little bit. f pies that's kind of the one example of a non-true allergy, allergy uh, that affects uh, children. And then we'll have some time for some questions. So these are the practice parameters I keep referring to. They were updated in 2014 by this Hugh Sampson, who's probably the world's renowned expert on food allergy. 
uh, it's an update of some from 2006, but basically there's 64 summary statements that, if you sit down and look at them, cover the entirety of food allergy, from how you evaluate it to what you shouldn't do. And, and uh, these summary statements were put together by a group of experts, uh, some people from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. We have two kind of national bodies in allergy. We're about the smallest specialty there is. But you think it's hard to herd cats. Try to get a bunch of academic allergists to agree on something. Uh, so we have these two meetings, so it means we get to go to two national meetings a year. So it's a good thing, except for uh, to get a unified statement, you gotta bring uh, the two groups together. But these summary statements are developed by experts in the field. They look at the latest research and literature and they uh, decide uh, what things we need to be uh, doing in our practices. They rate them based on strong, uh, weak. They give the, the recommendations a kind of a, a level. A strong recommendation means the benefits far exceed the harms, and there's just clear, excellent supporting evidence in the literature. And this is things that we as clinicians, I mean, we should be doing like robots. There should be little, very little free thought in this. A good example of this is how uh, anywhere you go in the country, you're probably going to be treated the same, tested the same, uh, no matter what, if you're allergic to yellow jacket stings. Uh, it's, it's as standardized as it gets uh, uh, for us. Moderate, the benefits are better than the harm, so there's reason to do it, but the evidence just isn't quite as strong uh, supporting it. Or high quality evidence, you just can't get a study that would really, really demonstrate, hands down, a significant uh, of process. So this is another thing where almost like robots we should be following this. But whereas strong, you kind of, you do it and, and that's how you do it here, you start to be a little bit more sensitive to patient preference. And as we go down the list and we look at the weak evidence, this is where really patient preference will have a substantial influence. You know, pleasing the patient uh, might be a little bit more important here because there's just not the strongest clinical evidence of exactly how you need to do it. And then lastly, the practice parameters, if they make no recommendation, they just shrug their shoulders because there just wasn't evidence one way or another. And this is really maybe the epitomization of where our field allergy is moving, what we call joint decision making. Joint decision making is where the provider and the patient together decide how they're gonna approach things. And uh, you're, as a provider, the clinician's supposed to provide them the information, the background, so that they can make that decision uh, for themselves. So this would be the epitomization of that. You're taking patient preference and it's almost give, given the driving role here because there's just not a standard that you know to go by. So that's what all these slides are based on is these practice parameters so that if I was teaching the pediatricians this, uh, they could hang their hat on these facts and then know this uh, if they're studying for their boards. So food allergy, this is the definition from those practice parameters. It's an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. And two big points there are one, it's an immune response. So the immune system is involved. You're triggering something within the immune system. I give an example that in Georgia, if they cater to lunch and they only brought unsweet tea, I don't know if you guys are familiar with sweet tea, but it's amazing. But if they only brought unsweet tea, I would tell them uh, I can't have it, I'm allergic to unsweet tea. And they would say, oh, oh no, what happens? I was like, well, when I drink it, I get disappointed. That is not an allergy. That is not an immune-mediated response. But it is disappointing when it's only unsweet tea. So there's three main categories of these types of reactions. We're gonna focus mostly on Ig-mediated reactions. This is the true food allergy. This is what causes life-threatening anaphylaxis. This is the same type of allergy if you're allergic to cats or yellow jackets or peanuts. But that is sometimes referred to as true food allergy or what clinicians are usually thinking when you talk about food allergies. The second group is these IgE associated. Oh, so IgE is an antibody. If you're allergic to cats, you have a three-dimensional protein antibody that attaches to the three-dimensional protein of cat allergy. And when these two three-dimensional puzzle pieces come together, it's like a perfect fit, like a hand in a glove, like a glove that was made for that hand. And then that sends off signals to the uh, cells of the immune system and chemical mediators are released and you itch and you sneeze or you swell. So IgE is the key mechanism in that type of an allergic reaction. When we get to Ig-associated chronic diseases, we know that that same mechanism still plays a role, whether it's your birch tree allergy or your milk allergy. 
they contribute to the overall disease process. An example of this is eosinophilic esophagitis, which we'll go into more detail. Asthma can be complicated by cat allergy, but there's plenty of people who have asthma don't have cat allergies. There are people who have asthma that don't have any allergies. So this is usually things, diseases that are complicated by the process of allergies, but not wholly responsible to the process of allergies. Eczema and skin rash in children is another example. Then we get to non-Ig mediated conditions. So this has nothing to do with those allergic antibodies. The end result might be the same. You know, if you're milk allergic, you drink milk, you end up with a foul stomach and, and you might uh, feel hot and flushed. And if you're lactose intolerant and you drink milk, you might also end up with GI discomfort and a foul stomach. But there's no IgE out, uh, antibody involved in lactose intolerance. But simple examples of that would be lactose intolerance, gluten sensitivity, or celiac disease. And then the food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, or FPIES, uh, is, is maybe the prototypical example that we see in babies. It's one of my favorites. I don't know, every time I see it, it just makes me think of free pies, and I like free pies. Um, so evaluating for allergies. Uh, everything in medicine, every evaluation you do, the story, the story reigns king. So in food allergy, that's especially true. The story that the patient comes up with is the foundation of our, uh, of our evaluation, the foundation of our diagnosis. The story usually holds all the answers. It's a matter of extracting, extracting that answer out of the story. And then we supplement that with skin testing and blood testing. That's not defined allergies, that's to prove allergies. And then the gold standard is an oral challenge. You think you're allergic to peanuts? So here, eat some peanuts and let's see what happens. It's not that archaic, but that is ultimately the gold standard to diagnose or dispute a food allergy. So details, details, details. What happened? Patients like to come in and they like to tell you, well, I was eating a hamburger, or I had just eaten shrimp, or I finished my octopus, and then they took, so they have an idea in their mind of what caused this. My goal is to first extract the information, the facts of what happened, and then we'll go back and find out what they ate beforehand or what they thought. I want to know, was it really an allergic reaction? So what were their symptoms? What were the signs? Did they break out in hives? Did they get itchy all over? Did they start to vomit? Um, did their asthma act up? Those are all important questions that can suggest that there's an IgE-mediated mechanism to it. Uh, so. I, I, I try to have them backtrack and just tell me what happened. Okay, so you were in your usual state of health. You felt like you did every other day at 10 o'clock and then, and get just the facts here. And then I ask them, well, what do you think caused it? Patients are right most of the time. They know what caused it, especially if it was octopus, because you, know, you don't eat octopus all the time. Uh, but if it was milk or egg or wheat, they might miss that, because that's just a simple ingredient in something. So what do you suspect? Have you ever felt that way from eating that before? How many times has it happened? Has it been happening lately? You got to determine all the timeline too to figure that out. They always say, well, I've eaten that all the time. Congratulations, you have to have eaten it before to become allergic to it. Your body has to have seen it before to process and make the Ig antibody. So what's more important is have you eaten it since? And did you have a reaction uh, when you ate it since then? But the, but the patient's mind is usually focused on what was different that day that they ate and that's not always where the answer is. And most of the time, if they think it's a food they've never eaten before, they've eaten it some, you know, it's been in something. Um, so how much can matter? Uh, you can get away with a small amount. You'll see when we talk about that uh, peanut desensitization, uh, that the whole process is to make it where these kids who are deathly allergic to peanut, if they accidentally get some, they won't react. So the amount matters sometimes for allergies. Cooking it, was it baked? So I, I'm, I just was telling uh, before this that I don't do any cooking. I know very little bit about it, uh, but baking a food is like at a high temperature, right? Like 400 degrees and a cake goes in there, I know like for 30 minutes. And then if you're scrambling eggs, it's like three minutes on the stove top. So it's a very different heat process. And when you cook it, the protein structure, that three dimensional structure breaks down. And so a less cooked food might be more likely to be allergenic. Um, we'll get to a little bit about this. What, did you, what else was going on? Were you drinking a lot? If you're drinking a lot of alcohol when you eat something, you're more likely to have an allergic reaction to it. Alcohol lowers the threshold from histamine release from our mast cells. Were you active? Did you eat the octopus and then go on a jog? I've never had anybody do that before, but if you eat an octopus and go on a jog and then have a reaction, 
uh, it could be a uh, exercise associated reaction. So you have to eat the food and exercise to cause a reaction. Uh, but I don't think octopus has ever been described with that condition. Um, and then again, what other foods did you eat? The octopus could be a red herring and uh, just be a false you know, clue. And it's really something else. It was the cashew crusting on the octopus. Um, and then have there been other times when you felt this completely removed from eating the octopus? I'll get off of octopuses here in a minute. So I just like to ask them in their words, what do you think caused it? And they're thinking lots of things. A lot of times you get, oh, it was the red dye in the Powerade. It was, uh, it was the artificial sweetener. And we know that generally that is just never the cause of it. Just mathematically, it's never the cause. Those chemical structures don't lend themselves to the development of allergy. You can certainly be intolerant. Yeah, your kid, your kid can drink red Powerades and it, they can get hyperactive. That's not the immune-mediated response and that's not an allergic reaction. So we know to focus on the most common foods that cause this, right? The convicted felon's the one who usually commits the crime. But truly, any food can cause a reaction. If you look at the literature, it's gone up since I made this slide even, but almost 200 different foods have been documented to cause allergic reactions. And then what happened, what'd you do? Did you just wait it out? Did you take uh, diphenhydramine Benadryl? Did you use an EpiPen? Did you already know you were allergic to it? Did you call 911? You know, that tells me a little bit of their state of mind. If you call 911, you're scared. And if you're scared, that can be a sign that there is truly a more dangerous reaction going on. When they look at connecting factors in the most, uh, the near fatal anaphylactic reactions, a consistent theme is that patients describe a sense of impending doom. If I sense impending doom, I'm calling 911. So that gives you a little insight as to their state of mind, because you might be seeing them three months later, six months later from this. They might remember very few details. If they went to the emergency room, can we get records? If they went to the doctor's office, can we get records? That's a neutral observer's factual report of what you looked like, what your vital signs were, what was going on. And sometimes when we're trying to clarify a true reaction from a false reaction or what went on, those objective details uh, can matter. And then what stopped it? If you took your EpiPen and three minutes later you started to feel better, that lends itself to a true anaphylactic reaction because that's the treatment for an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so after we get the story and we have our list of mental suspects, that's when we try to prove those, or document that those suspects actually cause reactivity in a different setting. So we don't just feed it to them and see what happens right away. That's not the first test. Usually the first test, they're in the office, is uh, skin prick testing. Uh, we have uh, commercial extracts for, I think in our clinic we keep like 80 different foods on hand. And those extracts are processed and, and uh, you can skin test with those. A positive response is, is very accurate for true reactivity to that. But the extracts aren't perfect and so you can get false negative results. So you don't hang your hat on it if it says they're not allergic to it. Ideally, you have the fresh fruit on hand. Oh, I reacted to a pineapple. Well, pull out a pineapple. Here you go. And we actually take a chunk of pineapple and we skin test you with the chunk of fresh fruit. That's the most effective or accurate way to do uh, the skin testing. We call that prick-prick testing. And uh, there's a picture of a, of a, of a tiny apple and, and getting skin tested. We do them on the arms. We prefer inside the forearm, sometimes the upper arm or the back. It depends on how many tests we're doing. The back is kind of like an artist easel where we can fit, you know, 50 of them at a time. I like them on the back best and then the inside forearm. That's where I seem to get my, my clearest reactivity. Uh, blood testing. The gold standard is skin testing for, for the evaluation, but blood testing is pretty darn good. This is where we actually order a specific Ig test. So we're actually asking the lab, what is the level of allergic antibody to that particular food? So you got to name it. I want cow's milk IgE. I want garlic IgE. Sometimes they call these tests RAS. That's actually an antiquated name from the old way they used to do it. They'll call them CAP test because that's the company that makes the machine. Um, but this gives you more detail. It can quantify. Now, the lab will report positive and negative, but positive and negative don't really hold true. Um, you, again, have to interpret it within the context of what the reaction was. The other thing the blood testing gives us is we can get more detailed uh, information. So we can get these components. If somebody is allergic to peanut, you can look at the subcomponents of peanut allergen, and if they're allergic to the ERA-H2 component, that's associated with the more dangerous allergic reactions. 
So if I have a very weak positive peanut test and I'm thinking about challenging a child to see if they're still peanut allergic, if their era H2 is, is the dominant subprotein, I'm going to be more reluctant to do that. If they have a high peanut test, but it's all era H8, I know that that's very, very unlikely to be a true anaphylactic allergy, and I might challenge that child to prove they can eat peanuts, they can eat peanut butter. Um, you know, we, we want to be scientifically, factually accurate on allergies. It, a lot of times we err on the side of safety. You think they're allergic, we tell them not to eat it. Um, nobody ever went to the emergency room for not eating a peanut, unless it was some bizarre gang initiation. But you do go to the emergency room if you eat a peanut and you shouldn't have. And then similarly with milk, we can look at the casein component. If you're allergic to casein, you probably shouldn't be eating baked milk because that's the, the a protein that stays in its natural structure even when you cook it or bake it in an oven. And then for egg, it's ovomucoid, is also heat stable, and so stays allergenic even when cooked. Um, this is what I was talking about, the interpreting the results. A lot of labs say 0.1 is positive. When I was in training, the lab, the machines didn't go down that low, so 0.35 was positive. So I don't know what happened between those 20 years, but, um, and then you see how high these values have to be. So that Hugh Sampson guy who headed that committee, he just, he, everybody, he feeds them the food and documents what happened. He, that's why he's the leading expert on it. So he'll take kids who are peanut allergic, he'll measure their blood test, and then no matter what it is, he'll feed it to them. And he was able to define these other intervals. So if your peanut level is, I just told you 0.1 is positive, it has to be over 14 for that to be a guaranteed positive. Codfish over 20, milk over 15, and egg is different depending on how old you are. But those are much higher than the positive cutoff. Uh, the point there is if you just get a bunch of food tests uh, from blood tests, you can have a lot of false negatives, very weak positive results, or sometimes even somewhat strong positive results that just do not matter. All they do is demonstrate that there's a potential there. Um, and this gets us to the oral challenge. Like I said, we feed it to them and we see, see what happens. We usually do this in a graded dose, so we give them a small amount first. They do fine with that. We give them a little bit more, then we give them a full amount. Uh, it's usually only necessary to do an open feeding. We don't have, everybody can know what you're eating and what's going on. We're all in this together. The power of the mind is, is pretty strong though, so a lot of times there are people very nervous about this. For five years we told you your kid would die if he ate a peanut, and now we want you to feed him peanuts in our clinic. So you can understand that there might be a component, a subconscious uh, component to make you feel like you're reacting. So in that case we might blind it to the patient, but the patient doesn't know what they're eating and we're giving them placebo sometimes or a filler, and other times we're giving them the real allergen. So we can tell for, for truly if they react or if they're having you know, kind of a, a mental reaction. And then the double blind placebo controlled is kind of the ultimate way to do that for research. Nobody knows what you're eating. You're getting placebo capsules of dust and placebo, real capsules of peanut dust, and in the end when it settles, we look and see what you reacted to and determine if you're really allergic. I've never had to do one of those in a clinic setting. That would be more of a research setting. But that is the gold standard. That will prove if you're allergic or not, is to eat it. So why is this important? Because of how big it is. Look at how many, 6% of children under five years have food allergies, one out of 16. Sometimes the percent doesn't look big, but when you look at one in 16, that's pretty big. That's two kids in each classroom. And then peanut allergies up to 2.5%, one out of 40. It, it used to be less than 1%. For some reason, the past 20 years, that's tripled, and I'll tell you why, is because we were making the wrong recommendation. And then overall, adults have much less allergy than kids, so the general population is about 4% or 1 in 25. And it's funny, if you were to make phone calls to 1,000 houses and ask them if they had food allergy, 12% would tell you they did. If you made them all come in and do a food challenge, it would really end up to be around 3%. So uh, people will report that they're allergic when they're, it's not proven, it's not necessarily true. And kids, cow's milk, egg, wheat, and soy are the most common, and majority, vast majority of the time, they will outgrow that by their teenage years. Um, and then if they're peanut allergic, tree nut allergic, seafood allergic, usually not likely. And uh, those are more likely the ones that also show up in adulthood is gonna be a major allergen. It's also important because people die from food allergy. Every year, lots of people die. I mean, little kids die from peanut allergy every year. That's horrible. I guess if you died the first time you reacted, maybe, all right, you've got to give it up to the food there. They, they won. But I can't imagine uh, somebody I love dying from a food allergy they knew, whether, you know, how they got that and how they ate that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 
But that's just a horrible thought. And when you look at the numbers, you see the, the ringleaders are peanut and tree nut. Um, by far, peanut is the most common one to cause that. And then tree nuts are, are right behind it, and then the others are the rest. Kind of like, anybody seen Gilligan's Island back in the day? You know, originally they didn't even name the Professor and Marianne in the theme song. It's just, and the rest. And there was only two of them, you could have named them. But it's like peanut, tree nuts, and the rest uh, as far as a, a fatal food allergy. But it's important because it affects a lot of people and it affects some people horribly, horribly. So these eight foods make up 95% of all food allergy. Cow's milk, hen's egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nuts, shellfish, and then the fin fish. Um, so when we're hearing a story of an allergic reaction and there's any one of these foods that are in the story and they're focused on the octopus, you know, it, again, it probably was the cashew crusted asparagus that you ate with it. Uh, so we, we don't only want to focus on the most common, but we don't also want to go down a, a dead path or chase a ghost. So keeping in mind that those are usually the causes is important. And I, you know, I, I'm a huge baseball fan. I watch my Dodgers every night. I was actually here when they won the World Series at Lavelle's Bistro. Tears scrolled. I wasn't crying. I was just weeping. It was like watching my daughter get married. It had been 32 years and they won the World Series. But anyway, now in baseball, if you watch it, they do this shift. If you've got a left-handed dead pull hitter, on the TV, they'll show you the percentages. He hits the ball 10% to this side, 42% over here. And sure enough, they put the defenders right there where they go. So you play the numbers and you're gonna get the batter out. So that's done, uh, convicted felons, you know, if there's a crime, you're gonna round up the convicted felons. I think sometimes they tell them, come pick up some tickets to a football game or you want a TV, and then when they show up, they, they, uh, they get them for committing the same crime they've done 10 times already. And then Texas Hold'em Poker is another example. The best players know the odds, and they're not gonna play a 7-2 unsuited. They might play a pair of kings, though, and they're gonna win with a pair of kings. So peanut allergy is our pair of kings. Octopus allergy is a 7-3 unsuited, if anybody understands the poker reference. Um, uh, cow's milk specifically gets its attention. It's the most common food allergy. 2.5% of children less than two years of age, much more in kids than adults. Adults usually are more like a lactose intolerant, not a milk allergy, where kids are gonna be true milk allergy. And again, most of the time it resolves. 80% of the time is what the papers quote. If you've got other evidence of allergy, you're asthmatic, you've got eczema, it's more likely that you won't get rid of your uh, milk allergy. The higher that blood test is, it does correlate with less being less likely to get rid of it. And then like we showed on the slide before, greater than 15 means you're gonna react if we give it to you. And the casein is the heat stable component. Egg is probably the second most common, about one to 2% of those kids. It is a marker that you're gonna have other allergies later in life. So if you've got an eight month old with egg allergy, they're prone to end up with asthma or other food allergies. In fact, the peanut study will go over in, in detail. Egg allergy was one of the kind of criteria to get you into the study. Most of the time that resolves by the time you're a teenager. Um, and then peanut allergy. Why is that one so important? I just told you, that's the one that people die from. And look, 1997, one out of 250 kids. 2010, one out of 50 kids. You know, what happened? Why has that just been skyrocketing? Um, and it overall affects more than three million Americans. So three million Americans are worried every time they eat. I guess that they could have a horrible reaction. That's a lot especially if they're all at the same place. Um, and again, we talked about the leasing cause of death. That's a, a, a repeat of that slide. It, it also affects, it doesn't always have to kill you. It can affect your quality of life. And it's been shown it affects kids' school choice. Uh, you're more likely to be homeschooled if you're peanut allergic. It affects uh, preparation of meals. So parents are under stress preparing meals. It affects planning a vacation. All these things are well documented in questionnaires of parents of peanut allergic children. So it's more than just affects uh, one meal at a time, it affects the family, uh, lower, lower health related quality of life and health life, quality of life in school. It just every aspect of their life is impacted somewhat by this kind of uh, dark cloud over their shoulder that peanuts could kill them. So here's why. 2000, we said, don't give kids peanuts. They're gonna become allergic to them, especially if you got a, another child at home with peanut allergy. Don't give their little brother peanuts. They've got eczema, no peanuts till they're four. No eggs till they're two. And we were making those recommendations. And those recommendations were based on 
anecdotal evidence at best, but that was the going thing. So 10 years later, we started to say, whoa, maybe not. We're not going to recommend any more restricting the diets because we're not sure that works. And maybe that contributed to this skyrocketing, skyrocketing rate of these food allergies. And then that brings it full circle to the, these latest guidelines put together by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the NIAID. You might recognize their, their uh, leader is uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, who was always in the news the last couple of years. Um, and uh, we've come up with an entirely different approach, and that's early introduction. So feeding babies peanuts, peanut butter, peanut products, prevents peanut allergy. And I'm just amazed at how they figured this out. So somebody said, wait, how come there's so much peanut allergy in Jewish kids here in the United Kingdom? And in Israel, there's almost no peanut allergy. What's going on? So they ratcheted it down. They did research. They tried to figure out, well, are kids more allergic in England? No. Is it the social class they're in here? No. Their genetic background, genetic test a bunch of them, it's the same. It's just, you know, they've just been transported to the United Kingdom. How about the peanuts? The peanuts in the United Kingdom must be worse. Nope, they're exactly the same. What it came down to is in Israel, all the Jewish babies eat the same snack. It's called bamba. And it's basically like a Cheeto puff, but it's made out of peanuts. And they all eat it. And there's peanut dust in the house. But that snack led to this discovery. So they're like, okay, well, let's make an actual research study. They gathered 640 kids, and they wanted these to be high-risk kids to develop other allergies. So I just told you egg allergy sets the stage for that. So these were kids with severe egg, eczema, egg allergy, or both, 640 of them. They split them up into two groups, and they skin tested them. And if they skin test positive to peanut, they went in one group. If it was negative to peanut, they went in another group. If it was over five, they were eliminated. Well, that sounds bad. They were taken out of the study. And then uh, all the kids who went in the study got a challenge. They fed them peanuts to see if they were already allergic. And seven kids had a positive challenge. So they said, hey, kid, don't eat peanuts, and you're out of here. Uh, they split the rest of them up into two groups. And for the first five years of life, one group was supposed to eat zero peanut. Other group was supposed to eat peanut three times a week. And then we had skin test negative in both groups, skin test positive in both groups. And at the end of the study, the numbers were amazing. If you started off no, a negative skin test and you avoided it, almost 14% of those kids were allergic to peanut when they challenged them at the end. If they ate it three times a week or every day, uh, only 2% of them were allergic. And then if you look, the ones that were already skin test sensitive, so they showed sensitization when you tested them before the study. Almost a third of those were allergic when they were challenged at the end if they avoided it, and only about 10% if they consumed it. Remember, these are high-risk kids to start with. So the, the, the discrepancy is absolutely statistically significant and, and kind of amazing. That's why I say this is the most groundbreaking food allergy research of the, the decade, if not longer than that, because we can change the pattern of food allergy that we already changed in the wrong direction by making wrong recommendations. At the time, the best recommendations. Um, so the, the new recommendation, instead of don't feed it to them, is feed it to them. If your kid has eczema or egg allergy, we want them eating peanut butter four to six months of age. We gotta water it down because it sticks to the roof of their mouth, you know, like when you're robbing a bank and there's a dog there or something, you gotta give it peanut butter. Um, uh, but you got, you, that has to be palatable. And, and then if you've got mild or moderate eczema, around six months of age, they need to start eating peanut butter. We know very clearly in those groups. Now kids without eczema weren't in this study, so we don't have definitive proof. But theoretically we extend that, that it would also help prevent food allergy in low risk kids. We just don't have the solid proof behind that. So complete 180 uh, as far as our recommendations on uh, feeding peanuts, not feeding peanuts, feeding foods, not feeding foods. Uh, they define severe eczema, egg allergy, and a specialist. That's not important to us really right now because I'm going slower than I thought. Uh, but in the end, infants, uh, guideline one, uh, usually they see their pediatrician. At uh, four months, six months, there's routine follow-ups. And so if you already have a child with some eczema or there's been a report of egg allergy, what we're recommending is that the pediatrician go ahead and get a specific IgE blood test for peanut. That level will determine if it's safe to go ahead and start feeding them a peanut or if they need to get further testing first. So if that level is less than 0.35, which is the positive cutoff from when I was in training, that's what they used. It's very strongly negative predictive, less than 0.35. Basically, no kid will react if you give it to them. So you can introduce peanuts, and, and parents can do that at home. 
Now, parents understandably might be scared to do that, especially if there's an older sibling with peanut allergy who had to go to the uh, emergency room three times from eating peanuts. So we would offer anybody who's nervous about it that this can be done in the office in a supervised fashion if that makes them more comfortable. If they're not gonna reduce the risk of peanut allergy in their child who's high risk because of they're scared when they shouldn't be, we, we wanna alleviate that fear. And then if it was positive, they should go to the specialist and get skin tested. And then in the skin testing, we have three categories. If it's less than two millimeters, that's the reaction to the skin test, then they can, get, they can eat peanut uh, and you should do it in the office immediately. If it's between three and seven millimeters, this should be done in a little slower fashion. That's where we do the graded challenge. We give them a tiny amount and we increase it every 15 minutes. But those children uh, should be offered uh, peanut uh, three times a week and, uh, to prevent peanut allergy. And then if the skin test is really big, eight millimeters or greater, then the likelihood is high and we don't want to start feeding those kids peanut. So there is, a, there is a step to start catching these kids through just the well child checkups. And what this has to be, there has to be good communication between allergists and pediatricians and family medicine doctors. So this is an easy process. Uh, you, you can't wait six months to see the allergist or you'd be too old to fit into the study. Um, and then you also have to be thinking about this. So it's an example of where uh, specialties need to come together to change the course of food allergy. Uh, it's an opportunity that we've identified. Home feeding, we want to make sure the parents are comfortable. They don't want to feed the kid on a camping trip or something like that. So it should be done at home when an adult can pay some attention to the kid and that you can spend two hours in that attention because that's kind of the window of opportunity for a reaction to happen. Um, and you want them to have it all prepared. You don't want them trying to make it. Again, the, the actual recommendations from this group, which never specify a brand in anything ever, specifies this brand of these Bomba snacks. So 21 Bomba snacks is a full serving. You can water them down and turn it into like a baby food. And then the amount of uh, a smooth peanut butter, two teaspoons is also defined as that serving. And uh, you've got to water it down for little babies so that they can palate it, so that they can manipulate it in their mouth. And these babies should have eaten some other food before this. You don't want this peanut butter challenge to be the first food they've ever eaten. Um, and then when we do it in office, we just follow a different protocol to be a little more cautious. Um, so uh, people say, well, okay, that's fine, but we already make some recommendations. We don't want to start feeding kids peanut if it means mom's going to stop breastfeeding. Well, when they looked at all the participants of the study, it didn't change how long mom decided to breastfeed in, in, in when they introduced peanut. So no effect on the length of time we breastfeed. We can still continue to recommend exclusive breastfeeding uh, to moms. It didn't affect their growth and nutrition at all. They did labs and things like that and measured their height. So they followed that. And eating peanuts did not affect that at all. Um, it didn't affect the introduction of other solid foods. So basically had no effect on the rest of their diet other than getting peanut in there and reducing the risk of peanut allergy. Now, the later this is introduced, the higher likelihood they're going to start off peanut allergic. That's why we want to do it at four to six months of age. We want to do it as close to the study parameters as possible because that's what we have the solid proof of. You can't just say an 18-month-old fits into the same criteria. Um, and then there's always a few. Yeah, you've got uh, a terribly peanut allergic five-year-old sibling at home. You know, you're supposed to be feeding this baby three times a week peanut. You've got to take that into consideration. Precautions are going to have to be made. You can't have the peanut butter or the bomba snack sitting around because the bomba snack is enticing to a five-year-old. They're going to want to taste it. So you have to have special precautions for, and, and, and basically patient by patient have discussions about that. We're looking at other foods now. Heck, peanut worked. Let's look at them all. So egg is another important one. We talked about that. I love the names they give these, the EAT trial, uh, where they're, <laughs> they're giving you a hard-boiled egg between three and five months of age. So it's just a visual of a, quite a research study, uh, hard-boiled eggs. But again, it's showing some protective evidence about uh, preventing egg allergy. The Pettit study from Japan is a similar thing. They're taking kids with eczema and feeding them heated egg powder. That's what I had for breakfast this morning is heated egg powder. Um, and again, the intervention is making a big difference in the amount of egg allergy you see later in life. The star, the step, the beat, the heap, these are all egg studies trying to do what the LEAP study did for peanut. And I guess some of the societies are actually going ahead and recommending early introduction of egg, just like we are officially early introduction of peanut. Uh, and then this just looks at overall. Egg and peanut are currently being recommended. Milk, wheat, fish, and sesame are not far behind. 
soy and tree nuts, the data isn't quite there yet. And then other things like pre and probiotics, vitamin D supplementation, and that really is investigational or maybe a negative impact if, at best. So we get back to the treatment for food allergy. The treatment is once you're allergic to it, don't eat it. If it hurts your foot to kick the door, don't kick the door. It's better than taking ibuprofen for sore toes or getting expensive steel toe boots. But the treatment for food allergy is don't eat it. An EpiPen, sorry, injectable epinephrine is not a treatment for food allergy. It's a treatment for an anaphylactic reaction possibly caused by food allergy when you didn't do the real treatment and not eat it. But it's not always so simple. So food labeling laws. This has been a godsend to uh, parents with food, children with food allergy. You used to have to know 42 different names for milk in an ingredient list to see if milk was in something. So the government got involved with the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004, which came into, act, uh, came into be in 2006. These eight foods, have you seen that list before somewhere? These eight foods have to be identified in a label in one of two ways, either in bold print within the ingredients named by that name, or underneath the ingredients it has to say in bold print contains and then list the, the eight allergenic foods that are in there. Um, and they, they determined that this was necessary because 30,000 emergency room visits per year from food allergy uh, reactions, 150 fatalities per year back in 1999. So the government went to Wisconsin and Minnesota and they said, all right, let's look at ice cream, baked goods, and candy. And let's see how accurate these labels are. And 25% of the time, they didn't list peanut or egg as an ingredient when it was an ingredient. So imagine having a peanut allergic kid in Wisconsin in 1995. If you got a candy or an ice cream, you had a one in four chance that they were gonna get peanut and have a reaction. So that's why the new guidelines are there. This is an example of what a label should look like. You can see underneath contains or within, it has to be named wheat. It has to be named milk, egg, whatever is the allergen there. Most of the time you see the contains uh, on most products. So back to that again, uh, avoidance. Um, again, not so easy all the time. Uh, preparation, you wanna be prepared for a reaction if you have it and you wanna be aware because this is where it gets even harder to avoid it. How about hidden ingredients? Hey man, my grandmother's cookies are the best. The best chocolate chip cookies you've ever had. Yeah, it's because she dusts them with almond flour right before she puts them in the oven. Uh, pesto and pine nuts. I, I mean, I've had that three different times since I've been here in Alaska. People don't realize they're tree nuts and pesto. Fish and Worcestershire sauce. That's just on there so I can say Worcestershire. Um, and then I did give him lactose-free milk. Well, I just told you lactose-free is not an IG-mediated milk allergy. So those are examples. Oh, the peanut butter is a secret ingredient in chili. I mean, that, that one blew my mind, but you never know. So we say no, 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 no in our clinic. You either know what you're eating or you don't eat it. And if you know EpiPen, no epinephrine, and then no eating either. Uh, cross reactions is another thing. I'm allergic to one thing, but another allergen is almost identical. Within the tree nut family, all the tree nuts can cross react. But there's a couple of pairs of twin brothers in there. Cashews and pistachios are almost identical allergenically. Pecans and walnuts. Some people can identify they can eat certain tree nuts, but they're only allergic to certain other ones. Uh, and that's fine, but if you have a new uh, tree nut allergy, most of the time multiple tests are going to show positive and the best recommendation is to avoid them all. Peanuts are actually beans, not nuts. They're more closely related to a garbanzo bean than a cashew. So there's very little cross-reactivity between peanuts and tree nuts. They are separate allergies most of the time. Uh, shellfish can cross-react, so crab, lobster, shrimp, crawfish, all similar allergens. And then finfish, there's a lot of cross-reactivity. But there again, people can often, well, I eat halibut all the time and I'm fine. It's just when I ate that tilapia. Hopefully the testing supports what they've recognized so we can allow them to safely continue to eat that. But there again, the safest recommendation is often no fish. We don't like to make the recommendation no seafood. We like to prove which category of seafood they're allergic to. And they can still eat shrimp if they're fish allergic. They can still eat fish if they're sh uh, shellfish allergic. Cross-contamination is another one. You know, they grilled the shrimp for the last guy and then they put your burger on there and when they flip it with the same spatula, you get a little shrimp on there and you have an allergic reaction. The, the notorious for when people travel and they're at a conference and there's a buffet, the spoons changing from one thing to another. So cashew chicken to firecracker chicken can do it. Kissing your boyfriend after eating a peanut butter sandwich. We've all heard that in the news, right? 
And he didn't even eat it. It was four hours after he ate a peanut butter sandwich and she had an allergic reaction. <laughs> Eating carrots grown on a farm is not real. I just made that one up. Please. <laughs> I think uh, one of the lectures we were like, which one of these does not belong here? So ant farms do not grow tiny vegetables. <laughs> uh, medical treatments. So we've all heard about I'm allergic to iodine or I can't have that dye because I'm shellfish allergic. And we know that's been completely proven false. We no longer withhold the MMR in babies who are egg allergic. And just recently, in the past five years, we now let you get the flu shot if you're egg allergic. It used to be, oh, no flu shot. And then we had protocols to desensitize you in the clinic. And so I, I, I still sometimes will do a multiple dose flu shot for patients who are scared because three years ago we told them, oh, don't get the flu shot because you, you, know, you could have a horrible reaction. And then we're like, oh yeah, get the flu shot. You know, uh, it's based on real numbers and real science, but it doesn't feel like that to you if you're the patient who was told you can't have it. So those three things are important ones because we, we still hear that all the time. We'll uh, see that even in reports from uh, uh, physicians in training. They still kind of believe these uh, connections that have been well disproven. Um, talked a little bit about this peanut treatment. So people who are very, very allergic to peanut, just the whiff, the, boy, the boyfriend's kiss after eating a peanut butter sandwich, those people we can desensitize and we can make them less likely to react to a small amount of in, or accidental ingestion. And there's, they're working on these peanut patches that you wear and increase the amount of peanut butter absorbed through the skin every day or week. But oral desensitization is kind of where the research is at. And there's actually a product to market already called Palforzia. It's just capsules of peanut powder. You go into the clinic and you ingest a certain amount of peanut butter powder. Then you go home, you eat the same amount every day through these little capsules that are pre-measured and uh, you ingest the pound of peanut you tolerate, then you go back to the clinic and they increase it. And then you go home and eat that every day for a week and you go back. And so it's a series of increasing ingestion of peanut done in a clinical setting with, with a real risk of reaction when you do it. Um, and it's, it doesn't cure a peanut allergy. You still got to avoid it to the best of your ability, but it reduces the risk of reaction to small amounts. So it's for kids age four to 17. The company that makes it won't even let you have it in your clinic unless you've passed their scrutiny. They come by and look at your clinic. It takes a lot of manpower. It takes a lot of structure. I, I don't think it's going to be in very many clinics unless they're at an academic center or a teaching center where, where they're already doing that kind of research. I know at the Medical College of Georgia, when it first came out, the decision was made that we would not offer it at the Medical College of Georgia, where you know, we were the experts of the area of the state. Um, and again, there's just a few phases to it. The detail of that is unimportant since I'm running long. But there is a way to desensitize by eating peanut power in a controlled setting to make you less likely to react to it. That brings us to the oral allergy syndrome. This is what I said is one of Fairbanks specialties. So this is you get local symptoms. You eat a fresh apple and it makes your throat itch or your mouth a little itchy. It almost never progresses to a severe anaphylactic reaction, but it sure feels like when it's starting. And it's from the contact, sorry, contact with, the, uh, with the food as you bring it into your mouth. And what happens is apple allergen and birch allergen are almost identical. There's connecting allergens in a lot of these patterns. So if you're birch allergic, fresh fruits might bother you. Apples, peaches, pears, rainier cherries are notorious for it. Fresh carrots. So there's patterns we know if you're allergic to a certain pollen, these foods might cause uh, some issues with you. Now you can eat a whole apple pie if you cook it, you know. Peach cobbler's good, but uh, the fresh peach will make your throat itch and make you feel uh, maybe sometimes a little queasy. When you test these uh, patients, they're very allergic to birch tree and they are not at all allergic to the food. Sometimes with the tree nut, it'll still show positive if it's almonds and birch, uh, but most of the time the, the food itself is negative. You know, they come in, they're sure they're allergic to that food and, and we're trying to prove that they're not. Um, this is my, uh, this is the handout I give in clinic. I keep trying to get them to buy me a color printer. It's a beautiful handout in color. Not so great in, in black and white. But this demonstrates birch. This is the one that's most important here. Apples, peaches, plums, pears, cherries, apricots. I don't think I'd ever known if I was allergic to an apricot. Uh, uh, carrots, uh, soybeans, and some peanut there also. There's a pattern for latex. This one's important for healthcare workers. Latex isn't as big an issue as it used to be. Everything used to be latex. So my generation, uh, any baby who was in the intensive care unit is latex allergic because everything was latex that they put in them. Um, but 
uh, if you are latex allergic, these reactions can be a little bit more dangerous. They're not quite uh, the mild ones that we see with the pollen fruits, but kiwis, bananas, peaches. And then if, if you've got peach, you can see uh, usually 55% uh, of people who react to peach will react to at least one of the other foods. So there's patterns that have been identified. Mugwort, we have that weed around here. We test for that weed. In Georgia, I tested for it only because it could explain some of these food symptoms that patients were having, but we, we didn't have mugwort much in Georgia. Um, they call that um, mugwort celery spice syndrome was the original name of it. And then ragweed cross reacts with cantaloupes and melons and things like that. Uh, grass pollen, also kiwi, tomato, watermelon, potato. That's not on my handout. And then dust mites and shellfish. Uh, so people who have mild reactions to shellfish sometimes are only allergic to dust mites. And the skin testing can clarify that. There's a particular allergen. Those components we were talking about, the component number 10 of dust mites is the one that cross reacts with shellfish. This is one of my favorites, food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. You got to eat the food and then exercise to have the reaction. The test should still show positive for the food, but you can eat the food all day if you don't exercise. Um, what, what I love is the first time it was described was from celery. I, so I just picture somebody, their New Year's resolution, I'm going to eat healthy and I'm going to start running. And they eat their celery and they go for a run and they anaphylax. I mean, they were trying so hard and it fell through. But we see lots of foods can cause this. Shellfish, uh, wheat, milk, I've seen of those. I've never seen an individual fruit, but I've seen celery, wheat, milk, and uh, nuts and seafood do it. These reactions can be very dangerous and you probably just ran away from home. So you're not near, you know, if you're jogging, you're not near uh, uh, help. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you took recognizing a pattern. So somebody had to do it several times. It's like, well, I, you know, th they probably had the test positive from the skin test, so they were suspicious of a food, but they would eat it and not react. And then when they'd eat it, it had to have been somebody recognizing that pattern. And this is another one of my favorites, the alpha-gal allergy. This is the mammal meat tick bite allergy I referred to. And it just how they came up with this. So they had this new drug, cetuximab, to, to treat uh, colorectal cancer. And they were using, they were researching it. The study was on, so the companies that developed it were researching it. And people were having allergic reactions to their very first dose. Some people died from the first dose. And theoretically, they can't be allergic to it. So they looked to see, well, sure enough, those people had antibodies, Ig antibodies, to cetuximab. Well, where did they get those from? They looked further into it, and it turns out they were actually allergic to this galactose alpha-1,3 galactose oligosaccharide. And that's an oligosaccharide that's expressed on the tissues of any mammal lower than a primate. Uh, humans and primates, the gene for making that is, is, is uh, not even functional. So we have natural antibodies against it. That's why we can't get like uh, transplants from a marmot or something like that, um, because we have natural IgG antibodies to this. But these people had IgE allergic antibodies to it. And so, at the same time that that was going on, it was only happening in patients in the Southeast. Well, at the same time at the University of Virginia where they were involved in creating the antibody test for this alpha-gal, they were noticing an increasing number of people having allergic reactions to red meats, particularly outdoorsy guys, hunters and stuff like that. And so they were scratching their head about that. Why is there all this red meat allergy exploding all of a sudden? Well, luckily at the 1992 Georgia allergy meeting, somebody had presented a set of 10 patients in Georgia where they had allergic reactions to red meat and they all had had tick bites in the weeks preceding it. It never got published, it just got presented like I'm presenting this, but it was original research. And so it did get uh, documented somewhere and they were able to find that, they put that connection together. They superimposed where the reactions were happening with where uh, uh, a tick-borne disease can happen and then they actually through uh, centers of disease control, put it exactly on top of where the lone star tick is. So now they had this theory of lone star tick bites creating red meat allergy because of this oligosaccharide alpha-gal. Uh, you know, this is statistician, is an epidemiologist, and doctors and all them working together to come up with this. Uh, and in the description is the same patient after patient. It's usually more likely a man. They have a big steak dinner, they go to bed, and they wake up having an allergic reaction some six, eight hours later. 
And that's what's unusual about it. It never happens like right when they eat the food. It's hours and hours later. I even one time had a patient who was the president of the local cattlemen's association. They had their annual steak dinner, and he woke up in the middle of the night uh, covered in hives. And I don't know if that's irony or poetic justice or how you want to describe that, but I thought he was the absolute poster boy for this condition. So what's unique about it is that usually it's proteins, which are much smaller than oligosaccharides, and usually allergic reactions happen immediately, and this is delayed. And we're still trying to figure that out. And we don't know what it is about this Lone Star tick bite. Why does it do this? Is it something that's naturally in tick saliva? And there's some very rec recent research that shows that like a naive tick who's never eaten anything else uh, can trigger this. So maybe that's the leading thing is it's just part of the tick saliva. Residual proteins from what they were last on. So this tick was hanging on a cow somewhere and then it bit you and so that causes that to happen. Or a microorganism like these little microorganisms that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever or Lyme disease. Is there something like that that we don't know about yet that causes this? So again, it's, it's the Lone Star Tick. Now in Australia, it's a whole different tick. But does anybody know how to tell the difference between Lone Star Tick and the other ticks? No? It's their tiny little cowboy hats and spurs. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, you, if you bit by a tick in Georgia, then it was probably the Lone Star Tick. Um, I'm trying to finish quick, but Ig-associated conditions. We talked uh, briefly about these. These are disease, chronic disease conditions that Ig mediated allergy can complicate. Everybody who comes in the clinic breaking out hives is sure it's something they're eating. And I know when they walk in the door, it's almost never something they eat. If it's an acute event, just like happening a few days, maybe one out of five, it's a food allergy. If it's been going on for six weeks, one out of 50, is there a food allergy involved? So uh, uh, testing to a whole bunch of foods for chronic hives is just not the way to go. You're not gonna hit on something very often. Unfortunately, when you do find something, it's like a magic bullet. So you've gotta balance how much evaluation to do there. Uh, eosinophilic esophagitis is the one I wanted to cover real quick. It's a new, it's, uh, since I was in training, this has been developed. Eosinophils rush to the esophagus, cause swelling in the esophagus. You eat food and it sticks, it gets stuck there. So a food impaction should always be worked up for EOE. Uh, anytime people complain that they gotta drink a lot to wash stuff down, they should be suspicious of this. We don't know the long-term repercussions, if it's a pre pre uh, precessor for cancer or not. Uh, so it's something that uh, we need to be aware of now. When I was in training, if they do a scope and biopsy of the esophagus, they wouldn't even look for eosinophils. Now that's a routine to identify this condition. And uh, we know that seasonal allergies correlate with it, so this disease gets worse in the spring if you're allergic to birch trees. It's not caused by birch tree allergy, but there's a relationship there. And we know that certain foods can show up. So the treatment is to eat nothing. You get to drink these elemental shakes like they do in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit. And if there's no allergen in it at all, it's broken down to the amino acid level, it can't trigger anything. That works for everybody who does it. Nobody can do that. I mean, um, and then so they eliminate the top 10 foods, just like we've shown you, those same foods. If you don't eat those, maybe 90, 95% of people get better. And then milk-free alone improves about two-thirds of them. So we allergy test these people for environmental allergies. We allergy test them to see if there's any foods that are obviously should be out of their diet and then we have to guide them. We don't have gastroenterologists here in, in Fairbanks, so I'm finding uh, a lot more of these patients at my front door where I have to drive these decisions uh, with them instead of uh, just providing the allergy information. Um, there again, the food elimination is usually pretty effective. F-Pies, real quick, non-Ig mediated, little babies, uh, get it from milk, it's very common. It shows up with blood in their stool. What's scarier than opening your baby's diaper and there's blood in the stool? Uh, but the treatment is simple. It's elimination of milk. So a baby with blood in their diaper, take them off of milk is, the, is probably the first step. Uh, this is, if they have these reactions, if you give them a bunch of milk, they, they kind of go ash and gray. They third space all their fluid, they get dehydrated. EpiPens don't help. So you think they're having an allergic reaction, you give them an EpiPen, it's useless. You gotta give them volume. Uh, resuscitation. And then adults, uh, shrimp can show up this, this way. It's the most common food to cause it in adults. Again, not shrimp allergy. Shrimp allergy, they'll break out in hives and their throat will swell up. But if they end up in the bathroom all night after a shrimp dinner, it's uh, f pies from shrimp, not uh, shrimp allergy. And after doing this talk once for some pediatricians, a pediatrician came up and explained to me how he ruined his honeymoon uh, because that's when he learned he had 
shrimp F pies. So he ate a whole bunch of shrimp the first night and then spent a day and a half vomiting and on the, the toilet. And then he had to see if it was for real. So the next dinner he had more shrimp. And by the time he was better, the cruise was over. So testing is no help here because there's nothing that shows it. So basically the story is what makes this diagnosis. All right, so quick summary. Food allergy affects all ages, several different mechanisms. What's the one treatment? True treatment is avoidance. Right, allergies can be dangerous. What allergies um, have we accumulated from what is in the food we eat? For example, I think uh, corn until maybe it's changed was a registered pesticide from what they put, they grow the corn with, they kill the bug that bites it. And physiologically, I'm a corn liver. I had to knock mm -hmm. it off. Now I've come back and I'm okay. What besides, I guess there's a big effect when you eat, eat peanuts when you're, you're, you're a baby, maybe what's coming back to us now from modern foods? And right, well, um, uh, like genetically modified foods, we have a specific practice parameter that says that the, the FDA clears those for allergenicity. And so we recommend that people don't be worried about those and causing food allergy. Now, other things like pesticides and chemicals, you know, if that's in a food, that still can cause an immune response. Anything that irritates the gastrointestinal tract will lead to kind of a different absorption of foods. Like when we have a baby who has F pies to milk, it's not Ig mediated, but their gut's all swollen and messed up. And then when they eat other foods, it's absorbed erratically, it's presented to the immune system differently. So it does set the stage for increased uh, allergenicity. So I, I guess that could be a theoretical explanation for how some additives or chemicals that are artificially involved in the foods we eat that weren't there 50 years ago might be contributing to the increase in food allergy. So how do you treat if the gut is involved, um, specifically SIBO? SIBO? Well, Again, for specifically for allergies, which is what I manage, is we always look at giving the gut a rest. If you continue to insult it, it's going to continue to do things erratically. So uh, you have to bring about rest. And in little babies, we'll see uh, their, their milk protein intolerance. Uh, when they ingest it, it makes them feel bad. And you're starting to introduce foods to them. They start to just relate eating with not feeling good. And we'll start to see feeding aversions from that. And there again, that's when we reset it. We put them on the Neocate. They get nothing else but amino acid-based formula. Moms, if they're breastfeeding, are gonna have to start pumping and stuff. We have to reset the gut so that we can build the confidence in eating again. And when we do that, it usually is successful. And, and uh, frustrated moms at six months of age are worried about their child losing weight. And nine and 10 months are, are happy to be where they are and understand what's going on. So it's kind of like just letting that healing happen so things can, uh, can reset to normal. So does it take the elemental diet and for how long? I don't know if I can tell you an exact length of time. I think you see you start to see improvement in uh, growth and increased feeding. But usually when we reset with like a elemental diet in an older kid or an adult, we recommend 10 to 14 days of as much rest as you can. So we'll do something like that in a, in a 12 year old where we say, right, just give them chicken and white rice and water uh, for 10 days. And we've used that to clear up eczema when it's food associated and when there's chronic digestive problems. And it just kind of like, again, is a reset button. So I, I can't say I know from a literature, but I can say 10 to 14 days is what I use. Familiar with the heavy merch? Um, oh, our pollen counts. Pollen in, in the spring and the coffee in the upper. Anything happening right now here towards the end of July? Uh, we're still seeing grass pollen out right now. So uh, my, my patients who are grass pollen positive are the ones who are coming in complaining. But the birch has passed its peak. In the question online, it was stated the more you're exposed to something, more likely you're to develop an allergy. However, once you have an allergy, one way to combat that allergen is to expose them to it in increased doses over time. So, if you develop an allergy to something, why wouldn't you just keep eating it to build up your tolerance? Oh, well, uh, that's kind of a little bit off from what we said. So we said that not being exposed to it increases the likelihood of a food allergy in childhood. Remember the babies, we want them eating peanut. 
So, but once you're allergic to it, if you continue to eat it, if you have life-threatening reactions, that's why you don't want to keep eating it. Um, but yes, the theory of desensitization is exactly what we talked about for peanut. Controlled feeding can bring about that desensitization. That's exactly the concept we use if you're allergic to yellow jacket venom. We water it down and we give you tiny shots of it until eventually we give you a shot that's 10 bee stings. So you can apply that theory, but those are usually done in very controlled fashions. Those peanut product got approved for treatment because it is absolutely the same in every patient. It's been studied in a placebo controlled fashion and it's proven to be effective. Just continuing to eat it at home or eating local honey uh, or things like that, it's just not a controlled um, process. It could work for you anecdotally, but we're looking for things to apply in medicine that would work universally or to a vast majority of patients. So again, avoiding it causes allergy. Once you're allergic, avoiding, we believe, gives you a better chance to outgrow it.